Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Victoria Foster, the Associate Director of ISR, the Institute for Social Responsibility. And it's a pleasure to welcome you to this research event on public perceptions of dangerous dogs and dog risk. This is such a topical, important and emotive subject, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing Professor Claire Parkinson's take on it. Claire is Professor of Culture, Communication and Screen Studies, an Associate Head of the English and Creative Arts Department at Edgehill University. She's also co-director of the Centre for Human Animal Studies, CFAS, at Edge Hill. This is a world-renowned centre which does groundbreaking work into human-animal relations. The research that Claire's reporting on today has been carried out with two colleagues affiliated with the centre, Dr Laura Herring and Dr David Gould. And today's event launches the publication of the research report and includes some, some of the recommendations that have arisen from the research findings. Claire's going to talk for about 40 minutes and then we've got some time for a Q&A. So please type any questions and comments in the chat as they occur to you and I will pose them to Claire after her talk. I'll now hand over to Claire. Uh, so thank you so much everybody who is attending today. Um, as Victoria mentioned, I'm going to be um, launching the report today. Uh, which is titled Public Perceptions of Dangerous Dogs and Dog Risk. And I'm going to be talking through the findings and the key recommendations that have come out of the research. Um, I just want to start first with a few acknowledgements. Uh, obviously, I didn't do this alone. Uh, there was a research team involved, and Victoria's already mentioned uh, Lara and David. And uh, we also had a project consultant, Sarah, who was um, working with us um, as the consultant um, for canine behaviour. Um, and I also want to thank the Institute for Social Responsibility and particularly Victoria, um, who gave such a lovely introduction. Thank you. Um, and also Joe Crotty, who is the director um, of ISR for their support. Um, the project was actually funded um, through Edgehill University and via the Institute for Social Responsibility, so we're very grateful to them uh, for the support that they've given to us uh, for this particular piece of research. So, um, for those who don't know, I am just going to do a little bit of context first. Um, a little bit of background and, and where this research comes from. Um, a lot of people who um, are here today I know will already know about the current legislation. Just I'm just going to mention this for those people who are not aware, though. So um, the Dangerous Dogs Act was introduced in 1991, uh, revised in 1997. It's the current legislation that is in place and it was brought in to protect the public from um, dog attacks. And so the legislation that we have currently um, is split into three sections. Um, section one, as it says here, um, prohibits certain breeds, types of dog. Um, I will be mentioning these a little bit more later, so hence the reason for talking about these now. Um, and um, section two makes it a criminal offence for any breed of dog to be dangerously out of control. Um, I do want to um, make mention, though, of section one, because this is um, the what many people would consider quite controversial part of the current legislation um, because it focuses on particular breeds. So it's what we call breed specific legislation because it identifies particular breeds and classifies them without um, any reason um, linked to behaviour, it just classifies them automatically as dangerous dogs and then subject to particular um, restrictions. And um, so I just sort of mention this because it gives a kind of broader context than to talk about the current news stories, which I'm sure people have seen at the moment. Um, and there have been, unfortunately, a number of uh, fatalities uh, linked to dog attacks, um, at least 10 fatalities um, in the last 12 or so months. And we can set that into a broader context of the increase in reported dog attacks over five years. 
So we can see here there's been a dramatic increase. And in 2022, there were close to 22,000 reported dog attacks um, that caused injury. So I think we have to recognise that there is an issue at the moment with the legislation that we have. The legislation isn't working to protect the public um, and there needs to be some changes made. And so this piece of research sits within that context. It's trying to understand what do we need to do? What could the recommendations be to, to make changes, significant changes um, that will hopefully um, prevent and see a decrease in the number of dog attacks and that are being noted at the moment. Um, it's even though we, um, we we've seen this this huge rise in the number of dog attacks, and there's as I say twenty two nearly twenty two thousand in twenty twenty two. If you have been looking at news recently, you've probably seen calls for a particular type of dog. Uh, to be banned, which is the American Bully XL. And that's because this particular type of dog has been linked to um, a number of fatalities um, over the last 12 months. So this, there are calls at the moment to actually include Bully XLs and increase the number of breed bands that we've got. Um, so it's about you know calls to actually strengthen section one. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is why I think that is potentially um, an issue, um, why that's not the right focus and why we need to do, we, have, we need a different kind of strategy. So those will be in the recommendations arising from the research that we did. So just to begin then, um, I just want to mention a little about the actual research report, the, the project itself. Um, and the four key research questions that were informing uh, the work that we did. So one of the things we were really fascinated to find out was where people get their information about dog behaviour and dog risk. Um, there have been quite a lot of studies that have been done around um, looking at um, the, the failures of breed specific legislation, but um, there's been very little that's actually looked at where the public are going and where they're finding out about dog behaviour and where they're finding out about notions of dog risk. So these were things that we really wanted to target. Um, we also um, were asking questions that were linked to um, people's understanding of what's meant by a dangerous dog um, and what should classify a dog as dangerous. Um, we wanted to understand people's, um, how, they, how they interpret canine body language. Um, and then we also looked at people's situational awareness of bite risk. So those were the four key questions that were informing the research. Uh, a little about what we actually did. So the research was in the form of a questionnaire. Um, it involved just over one and a half thousand UK participants. Uh, the majority of these were current dog owners. Um, interestingly, um, a quarter were first time dog owners. And um, I think that's quite important when we start to look at the way that the, what the data is telling us later on. Um, only a fifth of the respondents had experience of bull breeds. We asked this because um, bull breeds tend to be those that are linked to only media reporting. Uh, to dog attacks. And when we asked the respondents about um, their relationship with dogs, um, an overwhelming majority, again, 87% of them uh, said that dogs liked them and that they were good with dogs. Um, we also um, used um, a um, we used a series of questions that, that checked to see how risk averse our respondents were for um, to give us some, some context for the, the, the situational risk questions. Um, and overall, what came out of that was our respondents tended to be more risk averse. So that gives a little bit of context for the actual project. Uh, the questionnaire was distributed through closed Facebook groups. Um, the majority of the Facebook groups that we used were those that were linked to particular um, breeds and people and um, groups that were interested in dogs in the first place. Um, so the 
participants that were involved in the project mainly were those who would have what we would think of as a reasonably good level of understanding about dogs, about dog behaviour through their, um, their experience. I just want to mention that there are a couple of limitations to this study. Um, we had, as I say, a reasonably good response. Over one, one and a half thousand um, people responded to it. Um, what we, in terms of the limitations, um, the majority of those who responded were actually female, identified as female, and overwhelmingly, um, when we asked about ethnicity, um, people identified as white. So um, there are limitations in that sense, which is obviously worth bearing in mind. Um, but um, overall, we are talking about a group of respondents who are experienced dog owners, um, the majority of whom, three quarters of whom have had at least have had more than one dog. So. One of the first things that we were interested in was where people got their information from about dog behavior and dog risk. Um, and you may be surprised, I don't know, to find out that television came out overwhelmingly as um, the, 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 the top route by which people are accessing information. So we found that um, nearly two thirds of our respondents said that they watched television programs about dog training or dog behavior. Uh, we did make a distinction between television programs which are just dog related and television programs which are specifically about dog training or dog behavior. Uh, so, for example, um, entertainment programs um, were, were, asked, were asked about in a different question. Um, and we found that more people watch TV programs about dog training or dog behavior than watched about dogs in general. So more of the educate the um, entertainment um, type of programs. In the entertainment type of programs, it won't be a surprise to a lot of people. Paul O'Grady's For the Love of Dogs came out as the number one program that people watched. Um, but more people, so 65% watched television programs, which was specifically about dog training or dog behavior. Um, of those, 36% uh, said that they followed the advice closely of those TV dog trainers, and 48% overall of the whole sample, so of all our respondents, believed that television was the most useful, provided the most useful advice about dog risk. There are some issues with this. People are accessing television and are using it as the key source of information about dog training and about dog behavior. When we asked them which programs they watched, these were the programs, the top four programs and the ones that are statistically the most significant. So um, Dogs Behaving Very Badly, Secret Life of Puppies, It's Me or the Dog and the Dog Whisperer. Um, one of the problems is that these programs have a variety of training styles. Um, some include reward-based positive training methods, some use alpha or dominance methods and harsh corrections. Um, and so we are getting inconsistent messaging out there to people through these television programs. So this is the main route by which people are getting their information. It's very inconsistent in terms of the messaging that's going out about um, training. Some of these methods are problematic. They've been widely discredited and they could potentially increase risk. So they may, in the case of the alpha and dominance methods, um, erode the trust between human and dog and they could potentially lead to further behavioral issues. Another issue is that these television programs tend to promote very fast solutions or quick fixes, which could be completely unrealistic for most people dealing with um, behavioural issues with their dogs. And just to give you a comparison, um, as I say, when we asked about the source of, sources of advice for dog training or, or dog behavior, television came out as the top source of information. 
um, somewhat surprisingly online sources um, were very low and books equally so and dog trainers so around 52 percent of people had used um either dog training or um dog uh, a dog behaviorist or dog training classes but by an overwhelming majority it's television that people are using as um, a source of information about dog training and dog behavior And similarly, when we asked them about what they thought were useful sources of information about dog risk, specifically television, and it was, again, the programs about dog behavior and dog training that came out top, 48% of people agreed that those were the most useful sources of information about dog risk. And then we have you know, family and friends, 22%, social media, 16%. Um, television news at 15%, newspapers at 13%. Um, I just want to, again, highlight newspapers because I'll be coming back to this later um, in a couple of slides. Um, when we ask people about their recollections of um, accounts of dog attacks um, in, the, in the news media. So only 13% thought that newspapers and 15% thought that television news provided useful sources of information uh, about dog risk and local authority was, uh, was even lower. Um, there was overall a perceived lack of useful information out there. And I think what is perhaps positive that we need to take away from this is that 65% of people said that they wanted more information about dog risk. So, there's clearly a need and there's a perceived lack of useful information at the moment. So we asked um, our respondents what they understood um, to be meant by a dangerous dog. And we started with an open question. And this was really important. It came quite early in the survey. Um, and we asked this question, what characteristics in your view should classify a dog as dangerous? Um, and again, you can see here, these are the sorts of um, the sorts of responses that we had. In the main, you can see that the majority of people um, were responding with something linked to behavior. And at this point in the survey, only 4% of people thought that breed is a characteristic that should classify a dog as dangerous. Um, the majority um, talked about some form of aggression. Um, for this open question, we actually had to, we ended up with 27 different classifications. So we did distinguish here between aggressive behavior um, where people said biting or bite, unprovoked aggression and signs of aggression. Um, and the other response that was significant was um, out of control dogs, um, or uncontrollable. Um, and then under this sort of general section of uncontrolled, there was unsupervised and not controlled by the owner. But certainly overwhelmingly, again, um, it was behaviour that was thought to classify a dog as dangerous rather than breed. So this was early in the survey. We then asked respondents if they'd ever read a news story about a dog attack. Um, and nearly everybody said yes. And then we asked them which breed they remembered being involved in that attack. Um, and of the 97% who said yes, 91% mentioned these four breeds, so Staffies, Pitbull, Rottweiler, an unspecified bull breed. Um, I imagine that if we did this survey now, given the news coverage of um, American Bully XLs, um, the Bully XL would probably appear in here. Um, but at the time when we did the survey, um, this was prior to the reporting of the Bully XL packs. So um, Staffies, Pitbulls, Rottweilers and Bull Breeds were the top breeds that were noted um, to appear in, in news stories, in media news stories. 
we then asked late after we'd asked this question about their memory of the music. We then asked people um, to. We then we then asked people um, a couple more questions that were linked to breed. So we then asked them later on if they agreed that breed made a dog more likely to be dangerous. Now, if you remember, a very very few, very low percent, around four four percent said. Um, breed when we asked it as an open question after we asked them to to think about news stories and to remember the breeds involved in those news stories all of a sudden the numbers went up so we've now got 31 percent agreeing that breed made a dog more likely to be dangerous and 36 percent in a later question said it should be illegal to own certain breeds or types of dog so we can see here that through those three breed related questions, um, there is a significant jump. So an open question without prompting, people tended to think about behavior. Once we prompted them to think about breed, they tended then, at least a third of people then were thinking about a breed making the dog more likely to be dangerous. The problem with this is that breed is a very poor predictor of aggressiveness. And we can speculate that uh, the way in which people responded to these questions um, and the way that they focused and seemed to change their minds about how breed made a dog more dangerous um, later on after being prompted, um, suggests that the focus on breed, when you focus through media and the legislative focus on breed, this can confuse the messaging um, about dog risk. So clearly, um, in terms of how our respondents um, were, were, were responding to these various different questions, post-prompting breed became quite significant for them. Um, we also asked people to, um, to identify uh, the banned breeds. Um, and what we did was we we gave people six images. So here's an example of what we gave people. Uh, so there were six images and of each of the, the band breeds. Uh, two were legitimate and four of them were decoys. The results on the right hand side of the screen here, the light blue shows the, uh, the legitimate images. Um, the, the, the darker blue, so you see the decoys. Um, and then below that, you can see people's, how people rated their confidence in be being able to identify these dogs. So on the face of it, this is where we asked them about pit bulls. And on the face of it, um, we might say that this looks actually quite reasonable. 36% of people identify picture one and 44 correctly identified picture six. Um, although when we look at how confident people were in identifying these images, actually they had fairly low, low levels of confidence um, across the board. But this was a question where people could select as many images as they wanted. And in some cases, people selected all images, um, some selected you know, four images and so on. So what we were interested in then was how many people actually selected only the two correct images. And these were the numbers. So people being able to identify the banned breeds, um, actually only 2% of people could identify both images of the pit bull, 2% um, for the, the Toza, 8% for the Fila Brasileiro and 4% for the Dojo Argentina. So their lack of confidence in being able to identify banned breeds was actually well placed. Um, and just in case you thought that looked really, really easy and you could very easily identify these, um, these dogs, I thought it was worthwhile just um, showing you a few pictures here. Um, and you can see that 
when it comes to actually um, being able to um, identify the difference, it's we we could argue that it would take um, an expert or quite a, a refined sort of sense of, of dog breed to be able to discriminate between these sort of four dogs that I've put on screen here. Um, out of these four, only one of them is a band breed. Um, they do all have cropped ears, which I'll just point out is, uh, is illegal in this country. Um, but you can see here that for somebody looking at a particular bull breed, it may be quite difficult for them to identify that dog. Um, so this gives you kind of a good a, a good sense of of that that difficulty, I think. Um, and this really takes us into those issues then with the with having a focus on breed in the legislation. So as I said earlier, it is a poor predictor of aggressiveness. We know this through various different studies which have shown that. Um, even experts struggle to identify pit bulls, um, people who are um, involved in this particular area will know that um, exports are, experts are brought in um, for pit bulls particularly, they use a series of measurements which um, are defined from um, a, uh, an article from the 1970s which um, talked about the characteristics of pit bulls. There's a series of measurements that are used by experts to um, identify whether a dog is or is not um, a banned breed. Um, one of the issues here is that the public may inadvertently adopt or purchase banned type of dog. It's very difficult to discriminate between different kinds of bull breeds for many people. Um, and we know, for example, that crossbreeding of non banned breeds. So, for example, um, some of the well documented cases are crosses between Labradors and Staffordshire Bull Terriers, which can produce dogs which then are classified as a banned type. Um, classified as a pit bull type um, purely because they have the precise measurements that are required for that kind of classification. So irrespective of behavior, it's about what the dog looks like in the case of um, pit bulls and of course the other um, three band, uh, band breeds. But another key issue uh, with this breed focus and with the problems that people have in identifying the different, um, the different breeds of dog just generally, are the media reports which many people use um, as um, a guide to talking about breed and how many breeds are responsible for different types, for different um, dog attacks and fatalities and so forth. Those media reports will often rely on non-experts. So there could be family or friends, uh, neighbors or witnesses. So those media reports will often rely on non-experts to identify the breed involved. And as I showed on the previous slide, whether somebody could actually identify um, a pit bull from an XL bully, from a band dog, um, from a Cane Corso, um, is is perhaps questionable and certainly the data that we have from um, the study that we've done which asks people to identify the banned breeds um, would suggest to us that it is incredibly difficult for people who are non-experts to identify different breeds of dog and certainly the ones in the um, in the, the banned breeds but I would sort of extend that and, and question people's ability to identify the different um, bull breeds as well. We asked people um, about their understanding of canine body language as well. And what really came back from this was that people really overestimate their ability to read a dog's body language. So people were, in general, they were able to identify the very clear gestures so, for example, when we show people a picture of um, a dog um, in doing a play bow, which is sort of um, uh, their front feet down, the bottom in the air, um, nearly 97% identified that as signal signaling play or being playful. 
Uh, teeth bearing, again, was one that people understood quite, uh, quite obviously, but they did really struggle to interpret other signs of stress or discomfort, which we might think of as being more subtle. So, for example, um, they struggled with images that showed um, ears back and a sort of tense jaw. Um, despite that, and despite being um, really struggling with the more subtle signs, and certainly with the range of interpretations, we have a huge range of interpretations of, of canine body language. Despite that, there were very high levels of confidence. So across every um, example that we gave, more than 62% of people rated um, their confidence as good in their ability to read um, a dog's body language. So we were seeing overall an overestimation um, across the whole sample. I just wanted to give you a few examples here. Um, so we had images of um, a, a dog with bad teeth. Um, we asked people how they would respond to this behavior. Um, this was this is the form of actually two questions. How would they respond if it was their own dog and how they would respond if it's a dog that they didn't know? These are the responses for their own dog. So um, with their own dog bearing their teeth, you can see here we've got a range of responses. But I just point out that uh, nearly a fifth of the respondents would strongly um, verbally reprimand the dogs. A tense or worried dog, we've got 35 percent of people would pet, cuddle or stroke a very tense or worried dog. And dogs showing signs of fear and stress. Again, we've got 23 percent here who said that they would pet, cuddle and stroke. Now, whilst this is not going to be in every single situation, of course, what we could say here is that these sorts of responses do have the potential to escalate a dog's stress. And by doing that, we are looking at potentially an increased risk of injury. Um, so I think this gave us a really interesting picture about how people are not only interpreting body language, but also about how they would respond to that body language. And we also looked at the situational awareness that people had. So where people absolutely overestimated their um, ability to read dog body language, they underestimated situational risk um, in almost every situation that we gave them. Um, so for these questions, there were a series of um, high risk scenarios, for example, hugging and kissing the dog, um, confiscating um, something from a dog that uh, they shouldn't have, um, approaching a dog when they're eating. Um, so situations that we know um, would be classed as high risk situations. Um, and again, over 80 percent of people in every case said that in every one of these situations, their dog would be unlikely to engage away in a way that was likely to cause injury. We also asked them about dogs in general. Now, when it came to dogs in general, again, across every scenario, respondents consistently said that dogs in general would be likely to engage in a way that caused injury, but said, but my dog wouldn't. So there was um, absolutely a message that came from this that people were saying my dog is not a dog is not like dogs in general my dog is different um, I mean we can speculate about this we know that people think about their dogs as family members there's usually high levels of um, humanization of dogs and so there's a very good chance that when people are thinking about Dogs in general, they they employ the knowledge that they have. They may know that um, it's risky to you know hug and kiss a dog, or it's you know there's, these these are high risk situations. Um, but they would tend to think that their dog would not behave in that way. So um, again, there was there was an issue here with people probably overestimating. Um, the way in which their dog would respond um, and underestimating their 
uh, this situational risk. And as I say, this was this was in almost every scenario that we gave people. Um, and it became even more important when we looked at people's understanding of dog, dog risk around children. Um, I think probably one of the most surprising um, the statistics that we got from this survey was that 44% of people um, who responded believed that dogs would try to be gentle and avoid biting children. Um, and obviously, you know, dogs don't discriminate in this way between children and adults, but there's a strong belief there that um, dogs will moderate their, their behaviors around children. Um, and nearly half of the respondents um, incorrectly believe that parents are almost always absent when a dog bites a small child. Um, I just included the other um, the other percentages here. So 23% said they didn't know, but only 28% identified this as, as being false. So again, we might um, speculate from this that um, adults may believe that if they are present, there is less risk from a dog biting if they're present when the dog is around children. Um, we did get a very strong response when we asked about um, children being taught how to interact with dogs. And we said, you know, who should do the teaching? 94% um, of our respondents said that parents should do the teaching and 69% said schools should teach um, children how to interact with dogs. Um, I would say that this is potentially another issue that we have because the adults obviously that responded to our survey have um, overestimated their ability to read dog body language and underestimate situational risk. So we might question what is being taught in the home to children about how to interact with dogs. So this could potentially um, be an issue, um, but there is very strong support for uh, greater education for children. So I think that's certainly a message that we need to take away um, from this particular study. So the, the key findings, I'm gonna move on to the recommendations in a moment, but the key findings uh, from this. So there's a perceived lack of available information about dog risk. Um, as I mentioned, television is the main source of people's um, information at the moment um, about dog behavior and about dog risk. And um, that varies widely uh, depending on the television program. And the public are saying that there isn't enough information out there at the moment. Um, people do overestimate their ability to read a dog's body language. They underestimate the situational risk. Um, and the public messaging about dog aggression, certainly where it's linked to breed, needs to change. So these are the recommendations that have come out of the report. The first one, probably unsurprising for a lot of people, will be that the focus needs to shift from breed to education. Um, and the there needs to be certainly greater education about bite risk and the awareness of canine body language. But the problem that we've got is whilst we're focusing, while we have breed specific legislation, and whilst we have this continued focus on breed and breed bans, um, both in legislation and in the media, this will lead to confusing public messaging. Um, but we need um, a strong public campaign. And I think that there is um we we need to look at the numbers of dog bites at the moment the burden that that has now on the nhs and i think that we need to see this as a public health issue and we need to deal with this through public information campaigns um so although those can be quite costly um if we think about the amount of money that it is costing the nhs at the moment um for uh dealing with the outcomes of dog bites and dog attacks um i think that this the the idea of a public information campaign can be offset against that quite easily um certainly awareness raising and education for adults um is clearly something that needs to be dealt with 
And this needs to take a number of different forms. So recognizing signs of stress or discomfort in dogs, but information about common high risk situations um, and also how to respond appropriately. So three, I think, different key um, areas of raise, awareness raising for, for adults. We do need um, education programs for children, the strong support for this uh, from the public, which we know through this study. Um, we know that uh, from other studies, education programs for children can be problematic um, at primary level. And when these have been done elsewhere, uh, when they've gone back two to four months later, the children did not uh, remember much of the information. So what this suggests is that we need to have ongoing and repeated education programs for children during primary education. And it's very clear that, uh, that television is a key route by which people are getting their information and also um, many of the people who are responding um, watch television programs and clearly are influenced by celebrity trainers. So using celebrity trainers or celebrities associated with popular, popular dog programs for public messaging and campaigns, um, as long as these are aligned with positive reward based training methods, um, could certainly be uh, effective. The, um, the other thing is to deal with this at a more localized level um, and a localized approach supported by councils. So the organization of in-person and online community dog training classes, uh, for partic particularly for people who find it difficult to access behavioral uh, dog behaviorists or training classes because of the cost. So for unwaged or low income dog owners, um, there's also a need for increased provision of, for, of information, um, which really could be coming from uh, local councils. And again, the, the public thought the local councils were very poor in providing information. So there was an expectation that they could um, provide better uh, information to the public. And then finally, um, I think that um, the team supports um, a licensing scheme to be introduced. Um, this is something which has been talked about by a number of people and dog licensing, um, there was a dog licensing scheme which historically um, was uh, thought not to work and uh, we're calling for that to be reintroduced um, with some level of testing attached to it. But this should only be introduced after a public campaign uh, which focuses on the core messaging about responsible dog ownership and the benefits to human health and safety and dog welfare. And that's the end of it. So I welcome any questions. We'll stop Thank sharing. you so much, Claire. That was absolutely fascinating. I'll stop sharing with really. <laughs> <laughs> And um, no, I have to say, I agree with Kelly's comment in the chat that this is just, you know, such needed research, so timely so needed so it's really exciting to see it being done and we've had so much engagement in the chat that I am going to see how many of the questions we can get through um, the first one is from Jane and it was about one of the early slides where you showed the graph and that, that depicted how the rise in dog attacks and she said regarding the 34 percent rise in dog attacks over a five-year period has this also been expressed as a percentage of the number of owned dogs in England and Wales over the last five years, because we know there's been an increase, don't we, in in dog ownership. Um, right. I don't. I don't have that data. No, I don't have that data. So um, that was from a different study. I should just say okay. it was. Um, I referenced it on the bottom. That was from um, the BBC, and they did a freedom of information request um, to uh, police forces to get the number of dog attacks. So that was dog attacks that had been reported to the police and had caused injury. And question from Daniel. Daniel's posted a few questions, I think, and comments. Um, so the first one is, are there any proposals to mandate training for owners before they purchase or adopt a dog? And I think you mentioned the licensing scheme, didn't you? So I yeah. guess that relates to that. So, yeah, so the, I mean, obviously there's nothing in place at the moment. Anybody can go out and have a dog. Um, there's, there's no requirements. Um, 
I would suggest that if um, licensing was reintroduced, and I think licensing has to be reintroduced not only for dog owners, but for all dog breeders. So at the moment, commercial dog breeders need to have a license, um, but somebody who you know buys a dog and you know decides I'm going to breed my dog tomorrow, they can they can just breed. Um, I I think that the indiscriminate breeding that's going on. Um, certainly need we need to address that as well because that is that's absolutely a core issue um you know we've got um we saw that huge rise 3.2 million puppies bought during the pandemic um a huge rise in dogs that were not socialized during the pandemic it's a huge issue and certainly that feeds into this and we can't ignore that that's really important in that so when we're thinking about that data and the increase in um in dog bites and dog bite fatalities, we have to factor that in as well um, to, you know, to, 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 to give us kind of the, the, the real context. We've also got, um, just in terms of the kind of the, the, the canine companion crisis that we have at the moment, we've got a 24% rise in uh, dog abandonments um, in 2022, as reported by the RSPCA. And as I recall, and I'm just trying to recall my numbers here, but as I recall it as well, there was a 73% increase in puppies um, and breeding breeding um, bitches being handed over to the RSPCA as well. So we, we are in the middle of, of a crisis at the moment. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Um, there is currently, as I say, there is there's no requirement for anybody to um, do any kind of training at all. Um, I think it's really important that we we, we have that in place. So a licensing scheme with some sort of um, testing requirement in there. And it, I think that we would need to have more research to think about what, what that testing requirement would need to be. But certainly, I think that we need to have something in there that um, at least checks that someone has basic understanding and basic knowledge to be able to, um, you know, to, uh, to, to take care of a dog. Um, Daniel says that in his experience, it's been the smaller breeds that have been the most aggressive towards him. And also, I think he later says um, his golden retriever was attacked by a small terrier. So he wonders whether owners of smaller dogs think that they don't need to train their animals in the same way. Do you think that might be the case? I mean, obviously, we didn't look at this in the study. We didn't no. we didn't ask people this specifically. Um, it's it, it's very difficult to know the exact numbers because of course um we we don't have accurate numbers people when when um dog attacks are reported to the police breed isn't part of the data gathering so the main way by which people are gathering that data is through media reports and as i mentioned in the presentation media reporting of breed is prone to high inaccuracy um, so it's questionable as to whether the media reporting can be relied upon uh, to tell us which breeds are responsible for attacks. And of course, when it's large breeds, bull breeds, that becomes a major news story. When it's smaller breeds, um, and again, this is, I'm, I'm speaking somewhat anecdotally now, it's something I've looked at briefly in a previous study, but one of the things that I found in a previous study, this is from some time ago though, from about 10 years ago, um, was that when the media was reporting on small breeds biting, it was tended to be treated in a very jokey manner. So for example, um, somebody being bitten by um, a Yorkshire Terrier was treated as quite a, you know, a sort of a, a humorous situation. Um, whereas somebody being bitten by a pit bull or a Rottweiler was obviously treated as um, much more in a much more serious way, often sensationalized. Um, and breeds become demonized, as we all know, breeds become demonized. Um, and, and that can be a, a, a major problem. I think that what we can say is that if we have this constant focus on breeds and certain breeds, and people associate dog risk with those breeds, they are less likely to associate levels of risk with other breeds. So it, it could be the case that smaller breeds, because they are, they are um, 
are likely to be associated with dog bites and dog bite fatalities in the press and so on. They're not focused on in any uh, legislation or, or through the media. It is more likely that people will underestimate their, their risk. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, we don't have numbers for that. We're speculating. But on the basis of what we've got from our study, that would certainly be something that we could propose, certainly. Very interesting. And then later, Daniel says that it's perhaps people that are bitten by smaller breeds don't report it in the same yes. way. So yes. it's all very interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Jane asks whether dog risk was defined as risk of aggression to people, dog bite or similar, or left open to interpretation. Uh, so when we ask, is this when we ask people uh, what what characteristics make, uh, in your view, make a dog dangerous? Yes. Uh, so this was open. This was a completely open question. Mm -hmm. uh, so they could write whatever they wanted, which is we we wanted this question, and this is why we placed it very early in the survey, because we wanted people to respond without any kind of prompting. So this is prior to us talking about in the uh, prompting them to think about breed at all there's no questions about breed so we asked them what do you think which characteristics do you think makes a dog aggressive um and so the ones that i had there these were from completely open questions we analyzed all the all the responses um and we had 27 different categories of response we um i i grouped some of those together so on the slide i grouped uh the four or five that were linked to aggression together. Uh, so those were four or five of the 27. Uh, a lot of them were statistically not particularly significant, um, but I pulled out those ones that came at the top. So the main ones were to do with behavior. So it was to do with aggression. Aggr what people view as aggressive behavior was um, the key characteristic that they felt um, should be used to identify a dog as dangerous, Breed, very few people mentioned breed, only 4% mentioned either breed or breeding. And I think it was 6%, something like that, mentioned physical characteristics. So large size, for example. And it's not until we then prompted people to think about breed and said, do you remember a, a, a media report about a dog attack, which breed was involved? Then when we asked them the question, does breed make a dog more likely to be dangerous? It went from 4% from the open question to 31% saying, yes, it did yeah. make it more dangerous. And then 36% saying dog, dogs of certain breed or type should be illegal. Wow. And Jenna asks, regarding where people get their info, read dogs from, did you ask about the radio and news interviews on the radio? No, we didn't. No. So um, that was that was the one media source we didn't we didn't use. We um, the 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 ones that we used were the ones we uh, so uh, television, as I say, television news, newspapers, uh, TV news, um, online books um, and um, the uh, how many people had used a, a dog trainer or behaviorist. It was so interesting that there were so few people using online material. I thought that was really surprising. But yeah. there's a question, there's a question somewhere in the chat that I spotted earlier. But, oh, yeah, by uh, Tracy, who asks what the age of the respondents were, because yeah. that will have a bearing, won't it, on whether they use online yeah. services. Uh, we actually had a really good um, spread of ages. So the majority of the respondents um, were aged between uh, 25 and 64. And uh, they were fairly evenly spread, spread across the age categories. So we had sort of around, you know, 20, 24 percent or so within each of the major age categories. Um, and um, it, yeah, it, it, in, in terms of um, income as well, and just I'm just trying to recall now, so forgive me, but um, I think the numbers we had were um, around half of the people who responded were um, declared that their annual income was just below um, was below the um, the median um, for the UK um, and fifty percent obviously at the median and above most of the people um, I think the largest group were um, in that sort of um, around thirty thousand pounds a year 
uh, kind of wage bracket. But yeah, actually, the um, the age of respondents was uh, was very evenly spread across the different age categories. And we're running out of time, so I'm going to combine a couple of questions, which are about the um, the sample and the fact that you question people that were dog owners. Yeah. Um, so do you think um, the results would have changed if you'd asked sort of the, gen the population generally rather than, you know, specifically dog owners? Yes, yes, um, absolutely. I think that the, the situation would have changed. Um, obviously, we were particularly interested in, in dog owners. Um, and the reason for this is because obviously these these are the these are the people who would be classed as having what we would expect um, as a relatively high level of knowledge. So if these are the people with a high level of knowledge, then I think that we can reasonably assume that you know we are absolutely going to need um, greater education um, for adults, especially in the non sort of um, dog owning. Um, part of the population and and clearly this becomes an even more uh, an even greater problem where we have adults who have no experience of dogs teaching children how how to interact with dogs so um, or talking to dog or talking to children about um, about dog risk so yes I would fully expect there to be a, a, a huge difference in terms of the responses yes Right. And then I think I just say there's been a couple of really interesting comments about licensing and competence testing. So I will make sure we save this chat and can pass on um, these messages to you, Claire. And where can people access the report? Will it be on the CFAS website? Um, it's actually on the Edge Hill website. At the so, moment. Is it? It okay. is. Yes. Yes. So um, I can I can put a link. Uh, actually, I can't put a link in the chat at the moment, but <laughs> um, I'm yeah. sure people can Google it and find it. Can't Absolutely, they? yes, yeah. Um, if you if you Google it, um, you can you can find it. Certainly, it's um, it's in our research repository. The full. Um, I just you know, I warn you, it's bedtime reading um, or a doorstop. It's 155 pages long, so wow. yeah. <laughs> so so be prepared. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Claire, and thank you everybody that's come along and engaged so well with this, uh, with the talk. Um, the questions and comments in the chat are just so interesting, so we'll definitely save those. Thank you. So thank you, and do get back to us when you've read the report. Yeah, thank, <laughs> and thank, you. What you think. yeah thank you very much to everybody who, who came for the, the presentation and also for the great questions and I'm really sorry because I can see that I haven't answered all the questions. Um, if anybody wants to get in touch with me, um, please do. Um, the centre is really keen to work with any organisations that are interested in any aspect of the research that we've done. So please get in touch with me about that. And if you have any general questions at all about the presentation or about the research report, again, just please get in touch with me. Uh, my email um, was on the <laughs> on the on the bottom of the presentation, but it's very easy. It's just claire.parkinson at edgehill.ac.uk. So please feel free to get in touch. Okay, thank you everyone. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.